President Ron Satan live for his party. Welcome to Lobodo Channel. Today's episode is the banquet of President Juan D. Satan. Ron Daniel Satan, President of the Department of Regulation in Yamaville, sat behind his antique desk, a 19th century desk he had inherited from his grandfather. It was a handmade oak desk with walnut inlay on the top. A beautiful desk. And he sat in a 19th century walnut chair, black leather upholstery, a huge heavy armchair. I'm trying to tell a short story here, a micro story, but it's threatening to branch off in various directions, and before you know it, it'll turn into a novel. So I just have to pick and choose. There's so many causes and conditions as to how Ron Satan ended up at the age of 55, the way he ended up. Of course, moralistic people addicted to punishment and addicted to scolding would say that he had made bad life choices, but in fact, If you knew about his background, you'd understand how he ended up. When he was manic, he had a lot of charisma, and that's the power he used, manic power, to work his way to the top. Even having sex with no matter who, he was omnisexual, and in this way he became director of the Department of Regulation in Yamaville. He had a woman who would come in at lunchtime sometimes, uh, about a couple times a month, and who would dress up like one of his employees. She, she would wear a, a typical office outfit and approach him and then pretend to be one of his workers, and then they would lie down on the couch and they would make out. It's hard to conceal this type of activities. Eventually, staff became unhappy with this, and they decided to confront him. He got wind of it because he did have people who were ass lickers who brown-nosed their way into his good books by providing information about office intrigue. He knew that they were coming to confront him. He decided the best defense is offense. Right away he changed the topic and started telling them about birds and seagulls nesting on the roof. Also, he promised to invite them all to his year-end banquet the end of the fiscal year to celebrate that they'd come out ahead. Actually had a little bit of a surplus, which was given to the department to distribute. So he was busy making cards when he was confronted over his embezzlement of the year-end cash bonus, which was supposed to, supposed to be distributed among members of the department, but instead, through sleight of hand, the money ended up in Ron D. Satan's offshore bank account in a tax-free haven. And someone in doc- documentation discovered this. And so three of the workers were elected to confront him on this. Now, he followed the principle that the best defense is offense. So he started complaining about the pigeons and seagulls nesting on the roof of the building and the danger this caused to the health and well-being of the workers when, because parasites and microparticles from the feathers and rotting dropping, bird droppings could get in the air vents and they be circulated throughout the building and inhaled into people's lungs, causing a serious health hazard. So he said, I'm going to call an emergency meeting and we have to deal with this problem of pigeons and seagulls on the roof as soon as possible. Resident Ron Satan responded to complaints by offering to send in a special force to negotiate with pigeons and seagulls that had been nesting on the roof, especially on air vents, which resulted in pathogens 
and microparticles being sucked into the air system and circulated throughout the building. The purpose of the department was to bring about standardization. Standardization was the mandate. Standardize, get people to follow regulations, and then it's easier to control the populace. And the techniques used roughly were intimidation, create a sense of anxiety so that they would be more likely to behave. And this was done through the psychological means of surveillance, interrogation, data collection, collecting personal data. The department was very efficient and had a surplus at the end of the fiscal year. And so they were allowed to keep it as a cash bonus for work well done. It was to be distributed. That was the understanding that the money would be distributed among all the workers in the department. But instead, the president, Ron Satan, through sleight of hand, siphoned it off into his private account. He had a an offshore bank account in a tax haven. Where, where did you hide the money? President Ron Satan, where did you hide the money? Three workers burst in to confront him. Ron Satan sensed their discontent, and to defuse their aggression, told them that they were invited to his banquet. Something unusual happened to Ron de Satan. He had a visionary dream, a terrifying dream that he was in the basement of an old building, of an old five-story tenement building in a dilapidated neighborhood that had not yet been gentrified. In the dream, somebody had locked him in a damp concrete storage room in the basement. A masked man entered the room and hacked him into pieces with a machete. He was cut into pieces and yet fully intact. A mental trip, something unusual going on in his mind. He felt intense anguish, like his heart was being torn out. Bathed in sweat, he fell down on the dirty cement floor and rolled around in agony. Just before sunrise, after a night of tossing and turning and sweating in anxiety, after the experience of taking his 16-year-old daughter to have an abortion after she accidentally got pregnant from one of her schoolmates. He'd taken his 16-year-old daughter for an abortion, even though he had long been a vocal opponent of abortion. He realized the necessity of this case, that his daughter had a whole life ahead of her ambitions to, to continue her studies, and so on. So for many reasons, he took her for the abortion. And it bothered him. Contradiction in his mind between his ideology of opposing abortion and the practical necessity of ensuring that his daughter had an abortion. That night, tossing and turning, agitated, finally fell asleep just before sunrise for a couple hours. And in a dream, his grandmother appeared and scolded him and then pointed her hand towards the sky. He pleaded, crying out that he'd been taught human life is not economically viable. It would be better if there were no people and that all money could be invested in silos designed to last thousands of years with computers inside to calculate the interest. Roast seagull and pigeon pie. Roast seagull. Roast seagull and pigeon pie. This, this was, was a mistake. mistake. Human, human life is more valuable than money. On someone's car radio as they drove by, he heard 
Beatles song, Can't Buy Me Love. At that moment, he realized that some things are of such great value, money can't buy. As he woke at sunrise to the sound of this car driving by and this song playing on the car radio, he felt this was a sign it had to be more than a coincidence. He aspired to change to the best of his abilities, acknowledging the extent of confusion, of his sense of stumbling around in the dark, yet something deep inside of him yearned for beauty and truth and friendliness, unlimited friendliness. In this moment of understanding, he felt happiness such as he had never experienced, the happiness that comes from friendliness. And so he arranged a huge surprise at his banquet. As each of the employees arrive, he handed them an envelope with their share of the year-end bonus. (laughs) 